Today I welcome David Cope uh, to our HKW talk on the Anthropocene. Uh, perhaps a short introduction to the Anthropocene and why we have you here. You are here in the context of a program we call uh, Inhuman Music, Unmenschliche Musik. And um, it was, from our perspective, developed on the basis of uh, the basic Anthropocene idea that by developing technologies, the human beings developed a world in itself, which is now on the other side and interacting with us in sometimes strange ways, sometimes very interesting ways. And you are a composer and uh, at the same time a software developer. So, uh, I, I prefer, uh, you know, computer, uh, what, would I, what would I consider computer Scientist. Computers, are, but you are developed software yes, at, the, uh, at, uh, at, at the same time. So uh, you are, let's say, on the one side a classical artist, so to say, as a composer, and at the same time you are, uh, yeah, you bridge the gap to technology. <laughs> what uh, not a lot of people are doing, I mean, uh, having yes. a classical education at least. Uh, so how did that come? Um, uh, when I read about your biography, I read uh, it started with a kind of crisis that you got interested in computers and uh, in software programs. Well, in fact, uh, it actually began earlier than that. Uh, when I was a teenager, I wrote my first algorithmic composition, called paper algorithms. Yes. Where I would write down a, a, a thing, uh, write down a, an idea for a piece, and draw it out, and so forth. You know, clear steps to, a, to an end result. But yes, my computational um, arrangement that I currently have with computers uh, began in 1980 with a commission for an opera. And uh, that, that uh, commission um, didn't work out so well. I had uh, some problems. Uh, for the first time in my life, I had composer's block, mm -hmm. which essentially, like writer's block, means that uh, I couldn't figure out whether a C was better than a C sharp to begin, mm -hmm. or a D, or anything mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. I really had a problem. And because I had already, for many years, or at least a few years, been uh, involved in programming both hardware and uh, with uh, soldering irons and, and uh, software design. Uh, it's Independently kind of, of your music career? Or no, it was dependent upon it. I, okay. I was with a, a group in, in Santa Cruz in 77, 1977, Santa Cruz, <clears throat> California which was very much involved with uh, creating circuitry for mm -hmm. making sounds mm -hmm. with, uh, with music, very involved with uh, Stanford University's uh, uh, what we call CARMA, the Center for uh, Computer Research in uh, Music and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Acoustics. And uh, so I, I just had experience, but it was related to music, mm -hmm. but, uh, but not compositionally. It was related to music in terms of uh, making sounds mm -hmm. as opposed to actually, uh, you know, creating mm -hmm. the order of the sounds as in composition. So developing a closer relationship to the software development and music, it solved your problem of composing the opera or? Uh, yeah, not immediately. It took eight years for me actually to produce the opera. And at the end of the eight years, I, I produced it in less than two weeks. Mm -hmm. oh. After all that time, because I had, I had to, by then, um, become fairly proficient at, uh, at programming, and my program was, was pretty much done, and so, at least at that stage. And um, I was able to, uh, to create the opera. Actually, it would have taken maybe a couple of hours rather than two weeks, mm -hmm. but I was being uh, very careful with my ears and yeah. listening to make sure that it's what I really wanted to, yeah. uh, to, to be heard. So you developed in, uh, in the 80s a, a software called EMI? Which yeah, Experiments in Musical Intelligence. Sense. Uh, who's, uh, you know, the acronym should be EMI, but the EMI Corporation frowned on my using EMI, uh, so yeah. it became EMI yeah. as, a, as, a, as a, f a feminine name. And, then, and surprisingly enough, all the programs I developed afterwards had feminine names. Why well. is that so? Uh, I like women. <laughs> 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 ah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, it, was, it was more friendly yeah. to have uh, a name that wasn't an acronym. Yeah. And I felt better, and, and some of my programs are interactive, and I felt more uh, interestingly interactive with uh, 
with uh, women sounding names. It's, it's, a, it's a minor point, but mm. it's an interesting one for me. So it was a program which uh, started to analyze uh, tradition, traditional composing by big composers such as Bach, Beethoven, and so on. It didn't and actually begin that way. It began, I mean, my whole approach meant it was to write music in my style. Mm -hmm. But I was having difficulties defining my style in a concrete enough way to, to program. Program, you need the exact parameters of what you're yes. doing, and I didn't know enough about my style. Hmm. sort of the forest for the trees. So I said, well, like, I know something about Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. I've been teaching them for many years, so I will program them first. Mm -hmm. That's how that began. Okay. So uh, in which way did you program uh, uh, Emmy? Uh, because on the one side, it's, uh, I mean, just a mathematical programming, but it's m much more. Yeah. There was, there was, as far as I was concerned when I began, I was more interested in what we call a rules-based approach, that is, more mathematical. Math is, yes. And so I, I you know, programmed the computer to produce Bach chorales at, mm -hmm. at first, as I had taught my students to do many years. But when I finished, all I had was a program that could produce Bach chorales, nothing else, mm -hmm. could produce code. Mm -hmm. And so I got the idea that, in fact, it'd be better to produce a program that took a database of works and analyzed that database for its salient features, and then, uh, and then composed music in the style of that database. So if I could get that to work for, for Bach, I could certainly get it to work for Cope, which mm. was my primary interest. And yes. So I, I got it to work for Cope, and there, there's the opera. So I just switched the databases. Whatever's in the database, uh, presumably, the analysis system will work on any style. That was, that but, was one of the key features. But before we come to Cope, <laughs> uh, we stay with Bach, perhaps, as an example. Um, Basically, what Emmy does, uh, if I understand correctly, is it analyzes the database, uh, in this case of, of Bach, based on Bach, but then started also to compose itself in the way of Bach, so to say, with a signature of Bach. How was Emmy able to do that? So, to, to, to uh, develop features which are based on concrete works of Bach, but going beyond that too. Well, it was important for me to, to, to find features in the music that were common in all music, that no, notatable music. Yes. Uh, so electronic music would be uh, out of the question. Uh, and and uh, I don't know whether I've done that, but I've certainly done it for the, for the composers that the program has emulated. And they have to do with the different um, hierarchical levels. At the very bottom, we're dealing with uh, material that, that is uh, you know, note to note, chord to chord yes. kind of features. It sort of extracts those commonalities and, uh, and saves them for the composing program, and then moves up to how phrases end, cadences, and so mm -hmm. forth, and the balance between them, the logical and melodic lines, the, the things that are important we call signatures, or I call signatures, that help define the style moves upward to sections, moves upward to movements, and finally yeah. to entire pieces. Uh, all basically working the same way, but with different terminologies, mm -hmm. and looking at slightly different things mm -hmm. along the way. But since the end product then of uh, the composing of the software is something in the style of Bach, but at the same time different, yes, the there, you done. would say there is a kind of creativity of the program there? Oh, absolutely. How do you describe this creativity? Well, it seems to me that you can look at the output related to the input. Here on the one hand, you've got, let's say, as many pieces as possible, but let's say 10 Bach preludes from Das Mimbo to Klavier. Yeah. And, and over here we have something that sounds very much like one of those preludes, but isn't one of those preludes, yes, or any yes, of Bach's yes. preludes. And this, this sounds uh, pretty much, I mean, People will disagree, but, but uh, pretty much like it could belong there. Yes. Uh, and so forgetting the machine for a second, we would have to ask the question in the abstract. We won't tell you anybody that the machine did it. We'll say, did you think that that creating this particular yes. end product that sounds like Bach but isn't, and sounds, you know, it can be emotionally gratifying to the listener and, and convincing to the listener that it's in Bach style. Did this, do you believe abstractly that this, in fact, was a creative 
act that took the, yes. and I think almost everyone would agree. And then of course you'd ask the question, well, or tell them that, inform them that in fact, you know, was created by machine. Oh, no, 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 then it was not created. Yeah. Well, wait a second now, it can't be both ways. But you would at the same time agree that the processes within the machine are basically deterministic proce uh, processes taking place. Almost entirely, but not always. In other words, there are certain points in any process where there's a pseudo-random mm. quality. You know, first notes, I mean, how are you going to choose where you begin? Mm -hmm. You just can't randomly choose there, mm. or the product will not sound like the output will not mm. sound like uh, like Bach anymore. Mm. So it has to be done in some way where you're choosing pseudo-randomly from possible first choices that Bach mm. made. Mm. And that pseudo-randomness introduces a little bit of, mm. of um, not true randomness, not true indeterminacy, mm. but irrelevancy to, mm. the, to the effect that that, uh, uh, that irrelevancy is going to be surprising in the output. Mm. So I'm surprised by mm. the output, even though I know that it's mostly deterministic. And one could argue is, is that that student randomness that is creative, um, uh, that could be argued both ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I believe there's going to be involved. But if now, let's say, on the basis of X works by Bach, you uh, expand, so to say, the Bach style by producing hundreds more uh, by Emmy, that in which way does that change our concept, our notion of the work of Bach? Oh, I don't think it really changes our concepts at all. It mm. doesn't change mine. There is the Bach literature. It's codified. He's been dead for centuries. We know what it is. It's been published as such. We know that's the, mm. the human-created thing. And then we know this other material, which is very much like it. And I don't, I don't see any reason why we can't appreciate that for what it is as well. Mm. We can argue about one is, what one is better or worse than the other ones. I don't think you can make that judgment. I mean, as far as, I mean, the, the computer-produced ones have to be judged with other computer ones. Mm -hmm. The composed ones and Bach ones have to be compared with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see the conflict there. Uh, if you want to get conflicted about it, if yes. you want some angst, yeah. if your life is unfulfilled and you need to worry <laughs> about something, then in fact you are the this machine-composed one versus yeah. the composer-composed ones are equal or worse, and in that case, Emmy's output will lose every time, yes. unless you have somebody who wants to be ornery who says that the machine composed ones are better than the others. Yes, yes. <laughs> but at, at a certain time, you stop this Emmy, yes. and it seems uh, was that just a pragmatic uh, uh, reaction, or was it also a conceptual one? It was conceptual, but very practical in the sense that both. I mean, actually, uh, many many performers actually very well-known performers wanted to play uh, uh, Emmy's music, but were hesitant to do so, they told me, because you know the, 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 the sonata that I might send them with Mozart, or you know, faux Mozart, if you will, uh, was only one of an indefinite number. Of, no, and the next yeah. one out would yes. be better yeah. than this one yeah. more interesting. Yes. So yeah. when do they draw the line and say, I yeah. don't want to do that yeah. one? Yeah. And, and, uh, that, exactly, that was also what I meant, that it changed the concept of work. Okay. Then, indeed, it did, because Emmy was not dead, and was not going to die, yes. it was a forever machine, yes. so to speak. And, uh, and human composers die, and Dies. music becomes yes. codified, and therefore rare. And we like things rare, and the yes. music we, we have, uh, you know... Uh, we appreciate that. We yeah. appreciate that, yeah. we give the medals, we, we give the yes. medals, M-E-D-A-L-S, yes. with rare metals, M-E-T-A-L-S. Yeah, yeah. And, and so rarity is something that, that is you know, more expensive, costlier, and we give much more prize to it. So there's, there's only, you know, we can, we can look at this thing this way. Uh, if we take a photograph of Van Gogh painting, okay, is it better or worse than the painting itself? Well, the bottom line is that there's no confusion. We know the original one, and we know yes. that this is an imitation of yes. that in a, in a photographic way. But and even a photograph a good isn't important at all, doesn't cost anything more than a photograph would cost, where the original is running for millions of dollars. Yes. So the uniqueness is uh, quite an important uh, yeah, point in, in the arts, yeah. uh, also to judge the aesthetic value of something. Um, could one say that what Emmy brought out is a whole 
potentiality which is in the work of Bach as far as creativity is concerned, which we normally which is normally not present to us. To a degree, I, I think that's correct. Uh, I, I think there are aspects of Bach that uh, we didn't know uh, before uh, the analytical you know, program was devised. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, whether they're important or not to know is another question. Mm -hmm. One of the things that it brought out, or at least reaffirmed, I think every uh, teacher of, of Bach uh, music, whether they be, you know, pianists or theorists or what have you, um, teaches a sort of general, generalized statistical normal, normalcy of Bach. Um, no parallel fifths, no parallel octaves, because those were not present in, in Bach's time. Well, the program discovered that in Bach, and, you know, Bach did pretty much everything. There yeah, are yeah. cluster chords, as seriously dissonant as contemporary music is, but they resolved in certain ways. Mm. And there are parallel fifths and there are parallel octaves, mm -hmm. clearly by anybody's definition. And the program was able to pull a lot of these out, count them, and actually tell me how many there were, mm -hmm. which was statistically small in number, and that's what we sort of disregarded. Uh, although there, there are fights to this day about yeah. whether they really are parallel yeah. fifths or yes. parallel, you know, octaves, because many theorists believe that they can talk their way out of them being that by mm -hmm. showing particular conditions in which okay. you know, they define it so carefully and so narrowly that yeah. they can escape. We stop now with Emmy and come to the second generation because uh, you, uh, after Emmy, you created a new program you called the Daughter of Emmy. Perhaps you can tell a little bit about that. What? Right. Well, I mothballed, as I call it, because I did not destroy the program. I just destroyed the idea that I was going to continue with these historical yes. replications in 2003. And yeah. even before that, I was involved with a <coughs> new program, which I, you know was very curious to me to see if a, a computer could, in fact, a computer program could create music in new styles, mm -hmm. uh, styles that were never before heard. And it, I got the idea that this program would, in fact, not use music that humans had composed, but music that the previous program Emmy had composed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, it used a, a, about 11,000 compositions that Emmy had composed, Post. many of which I'd never heard before. In, a data, in its database, a very large database. And its idea was not to keep style. Could, could one say this is kind of the history of uh, the new software? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And so <coughs> I, I work with that. It's, it's a different program. With any, you simply, you know, people imagine you just push the button mm -hmm. and out comes a composition. Well, in fact, that's pretty much what you do. Yes. Uh, but with Emily Howe, I invented a, or proposed and, and uh, programmed a, a, uh, an application in which you um, essentially interact with the program and, and uh, uh, converse with it in a, a sort of uh, collaborative way. Yeah. Uh, how did you develop the interaction with the program? You, you told last night that you started uh, to teach uh, Emily Howe English. Yes. Well, or any language, but yeah. Yeah, because English is my primary language. Um, as they say, I'm an American, so my definition is that I only speak one yeah. language. So I, I uh, uh, started with English. And I, the, the program is very open-ended. It's very small, very compact. Almost all of the program is the interface between the user and it. And so it knows nothing. It has nothing. So when I put in words, it, one thing it does know is to separate the words and place them in various parts of the program and then try to figure out what the semantics would be, uh, what's going on with the semantics. Oh, yes. So initially it just produces gibberish. Mm -hmm. And slowly by using what I call the carrot and stick approach, I say yes and no to things. <coughs> there are symbols, special symbols for those which are not part of the language, just symbols that I use on the top part of the keyboard that say, you know, don't try not to do that again. And it takes the weightings in the database for these words, changes them slightly so it won't tend to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely I learn it, I, I teach it, excuse me, it learns the, the, uh, uh, the syntax of whatever language I'm using and begins to answer and respond mm -hmm. to what I'm just saying mm -hmm. or what I'm typing into the keyboard in reasonable, if not uh, meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your relationship to Emily Howe? Is she some thing or somebody who is an extension of yours? 
is uh, she something which is on the other side? How, how would you describe? <laughs> you keep referring to this other side. Yeah. It sounds like the outer limits or, uh, or some uh, program. Uh, is she part of your creativity? Or? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think, I think the answer to your question about the other side and, and our side is, is both because I never know what she's going to say exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at the same time, I know what she's going to say is something that I have uh, inadvertently, because I can't keep track of all the waitings, um, something that I programmed in her. So it's, it's, a, it's like one of your children. Mm -hmm. You know that they're going to grow up and be independent somewhere yes. along the line, and they're going to fight with you. But, you know, if you, if you homeschool the child, in fact, what they're fighting is, is uh, what you taught them to fight you about. And yes, so yes. Is, are they on the other side, side. or are they on, on your side of the wall? And the answer is both. They're, they're over there, but they're also, they're also filled with you yeah. uh, and last, their teachers. Uh, last night when you spoke about your interaction with, uh, with Emmy as well as Emily Howe, you uh, mentioned that there were points of irritation. Uh, can you describe that a little bit? Well, it may be with the fact that, that, that to compose one piece to, that I would consider to be legitimate, it takes, uh, oh, I don't know, 40 or 50 hours. And I tend to want to do that in, 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 uh, in as big a chunks of time as I can and as close proximity as possible. So one gets very tired. And mm -hmm. I suppose that there are various times after Emily has enough language instruction and music instruction that, that uh, she does things that uh, I almost will her to do or that are so independent that's on this side, so, of, the line, yes, on this side yes, of the line yes. that, that I'm totally surprised and I, you know, I begin to actually I think, um, imagine that she is an entity of herself and that, uh -huh. I'm, that I'm actually talking to somebody uh -huh that's uh, alive in a sense. Yes. Certainly not carbon-based, but uh, electron-based. Yes. And I see no problem myself uh, with electron-based life. Yes. Yeah, we are familiar only with carbon-based life on yes. planet Earth, but electricity is a, uh, is a very much important part of us. I mean, yeah, after all, of our course. brains cannot work yes. with it, our nervous systems cannot work with electricity. It would be just as safe to say, just as right to say that we're electron-based beings, as we are carbon-based things. The carbon is much more intri intrinsically involved with our physical makeup, but our dynamic makeup is electron-based. And so when I look at I Emmy, mean, it's not surprising to me that, that I tend to uh, anthropomorphize her yeah. in a way that, uh, combined with my tiredness, that I believe that I've created a Frankensteinian yeah. monster <laughs> here, although it's not a monster. Uh, a friend. Uh, I just spoke with David Rottenberg, who is interacting with animals, with birds, for example, uh, producing music, music himself and creating a kind of environment of music interaction between him and the bird. Would you say that could be something similar with the machine, the bird, uh, the animal human being relation and the machine human being relation is something similar in that respect? Or would you say there are major differences there? Well, there are, again, I would have to say both. That there are major differences, obviously. Uh, Carbon-based, right? That's yeah. a good question based on that. But there are also similarities, I think, mm. because I think that any two uh, qu living or quasi-living uh, things, in this case, do, and, you know, do affect one another. Mm. They do change each other. We become used to one another in certain ways and expect certain, certain things or surprised by certain things. And that's very similar. Mm. Uh, so the, your interaction and cooperation with Emmy as, we, as well as Emily Howell, uh, did that change your notion of what music is? I don't believe anyone knows what music is, so it didn't change my notion. Mm -hmm. My notion is, uh, is uh, freely evolving mm -hmm. as I grow older. And your understanding as a human being, is it, is it changed by this is it more or less permanent interaction with the machine? Uh, I'm sure it is so, uh, but at the same time, uh, I don't know what it is exactly. Huh. And you don't care? 
I don't care a bit. I'd rather not know. Okay. It's much more important just to not do important, it. important. It's much more interesting. Interesting. Uh, uh, did you think of interacting on the music side with animals? Oh, I've done that many times. Oh, okay. I, uh, uh, not, you know, the, most, the most wonderful time was when I had a, we had a mockingbird in the, in the canyon behind our house in Santa Cruz. And, and I decided to get up every morning and introduce a certain whistled call into its mm. vocabulary. Uh -huh. And after about a month and a half or so, it started whistling my call back to wow. me. So I introduced a new word, if you will, into the mockingbird's vocabulary. It then left, and I'm still waiting for a, another mockingbird mm -hmm. to fly into the canyon and hearing my, you know, thinking that it may not, it, it may not only enter that particular mockingbird's call, mm -hmm. but to, you know, mockingbirds in the general area's mm -hmm. calls, and that therefore I, I have done something rather, to me, amazingly interesting, interesting. Yes. Uh, in the sense that, uh, that I've been able to you know, slightly get a notion of how mockingbirds think about their work. When Emily Howell is composing, who decides the work is finished? I do. Ah, okay. So she, she, uh, you take the final decision on that? Oh, Emily Howell was built to please me. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> that's the only I wanted it to please me. Ah. So <laughs> that's uh, so when it pleases me, that's the work I take. And how do you direct director? Again, with the character sticks. Uh -huh. I say I didn't like that, mm -hmm. and so very subtly, all the weights are slightly changed. The ones uh, that are mostly affected are the ones that made that decision for the thing I did not like, and they're changed negatively. And if I say yes, they're changed positively and slowly. It's not a you know, but yes or no deal. It's a, it's a very slow um, evolution of change until it gets brings the sound musically or linguistically. But the pro the proposals are all by her, and you just yes. say yes, no, yes, no. Exactly. Wow. Thank you very much. Great to have talked to you. <laughs> And to have My you pleasure. here in Berlin. Great to be here. Yeah, Thanks yeah, for inviting yeah. me. Wonderful.